Here we are now with chapter number 10 in our series, Impressions of Grace and Grit. Grace and Grit. Grace and Grit. I've realized I've been putting a bit of an an Australian accent on the grit, and it's become grit. Instead of grit, got to have grit in order to pronounce grit. There's a bit of a backflip that we'll do with our plot today because there are some things that will circle through nicely to the next chapter. So if you're following along in your own book or you're familiar already with this story, we're just going to skip over certain things, but we'll come back to them in the next chapter because they just they just fit better there with how things unfold. And today we're talking about, well, what it means to have a time to heal. And we'll see what Treya and Ken were doing with their time to heal. They moved to a new house. So they'd only just moved into Lake Tahoe. And yet it wasn't working out. It wasn't right for them. So they decided to move somewhere else. And that's really something. That really is something. There's a lot in that. Where you live, make no mistake about it, there is a lot in that. And you'd think on the surface, wow, it's this custom-built house. It's got these beautiful views. It's surrounded by nature. It should be perfect for them. And yet, well, partly because it wasn't right for them to begin with, and partly because they had some terrible experiences there, and Partly because, well, actually all the details and the putting it together was a stressful process, which is just reminding them, which is they are reminded of when they are there. And just the feeling, just the feeling isn't right. And if you really look at the decisions you make about where you live, then you can look back and say that was the wrong decision based on gut instinct. So they move back to the Bay Area, into a small town. And the other thing about this is that they're near their support networks. They're not so far out of the way. Support networks such as family, such as certain friends, such as certain institutions, and also the doctors and the hospitals. So that's also important. Where your network is, The the house and even a place, the ambience and the look of a neighborhood is one thing, but your social network and your social roots, well, that's also a very big thing. There's also this institution that Trey has been mentioning a few times, which is Find Horn. And this is a, I guess you could call it a sort of new age It's not quite New Age. It's like a second-tier institution, which is developed by a band of seekers. So there are many varieties of these sorts of, I guess you could call them communes or communities or institutions or groups or places where you go to do certain practices and rejuvenate and do spiritual things that can't be done by yourself. And this is hers. This is just the one that resonates with her. And it's sort of like Esalen Institute, or today, more recently, we have the Isha Foundation, or the one I've loved particularly is, well, Osho International, which is the one that Osho founded. And Osho did start one in America, but that's a different story. So they're talking about forgiveness because so much about healing comes down to forgiveness. And Treya is still studying the Course in Miracles. And this is a quote that she's put in to illustrate how she feels. So this is from the Course in Miracles. What could you want 
that forgiveness cannot give. Do you want peace? Forgiveness offers it. Do you want happiness, a quiet mind, certainty of purpose, and a sense of worth and beauty that transcends the world? Do you want care and safety, and the warmth of such protection always? Do you want a quietness that cannot be disturbed, a gentleness that can never be hurt, a deep abiding comfort, and a rest so peaceful it can never be upset? All this forgiveness offers you, and more. Forgiveness offers everything I want. Today I have accepted this as true. Today I have received the gifts of God. End quote. And Ken is into this as well, because he's in the position where he realizes he's been really tough on Treya. And it's also true that she's been really tough on him, so he needs to forgive both her and himself. And he explains that the ego, or the self-contraction, which caused so much hell in these recent months for them, is not just a cognitive construct. It's not just a thing in the mind. It's actually an affective construct as well which means it's not propped up just by words and thoughts and concepts, but by feelings and emotions. It's connected to the nervous system. And the primal emotion of the ego is fear, which is followed closely by resentment. And as the Upanishads put it, wherever there is other, there is fear. And the ego, well, it's kept in existence by this collection of insults. It carries its bruises. Its very fabric is all these bad feelings, this sense of separation, this sense of you and me. And it actively is working to uphold these hurts and these insults, because if it didn't, well, then it would evaporate. So what your ego is doing, according to this, is it's going around and trying to get others to confess to their faults. You hurt me. Say you're sorry. And if that works, then it turns out to be like, ha, got you. I knew you did that to me. And the ego never forgives. The ego never forgets. And that goes both for insults which are real and also imagined. So you can say, well, Dosta, what happens if someone actually does insult you? What if someone actually is out and mean to get you? Well, in this case, it doesn't matter. It has no bearing at all on what the intention is. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. And it could be both that someone has ill intentions or someone has kind intentions, and yet it's the way you as an ego, as a separate self, receive it that makes it hurtful. And for Ken, this was really tricky because he became hurt and then he became snide. And then he had these snappy comments. And then Treya was in the same situation. She was becoming controlling and it was a vicious circle because it would go back and forth, back and forth. And now with the help of therapy, couples therapy, they're working on how to identify this circle. And Ken is also realizing that for sometimes it's difficult to forgive and in those times, well, you can actually use the grace of God. You can use the power of God to forgive on his behalf. So you're channeling someone else or something else in order to do the forgiveness. And that's another way of relinquishing your own power, your own will 
in the process of forgiveness because forgiveness is not a matter of, oh, I have to do it, I have to push, I need to really control hard and have a great amount of will and autonomy to do it. That's not how forgiveness works at all. No, it's a relinquishing. So invoking the power of God can help with that. And at this stage in our novel, we know that in this, at this stage in our narrative, we know that we're not talking about the blue meme God. We're not talking about mythic stage God. We're talking about the second tier definition of God, which is complex and vast and multidimensional. And then, well, something else quite important comes along, which is Treya's period returns. And she writes, hooray, in her diary. Maybe I can have Ken's child after all. So that's a very positive thing. And that's a good thing to have happen for Treya in her recovery. And she also realizes, well, they both also find out that, well, Ken's actually got a virus. And they didn't know. The poor guy. And he's been interpreting his depression. He's been interpreting his virus or his symptoms, his feelings, his fatigue as a depression. And when he's first diagnosed, he doesn't even believe it. He says, no, 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 it it, it actually is a severe depression. And he then goes to another doctor and, well, the same diagnosis comes back. And he says, no, 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 it was a depression. And then he goes to the third doctor and, well, by the time you get to the third doctor, he has to agree that it's a virus. So now he's in the time where he's starting to actually let the virus run out and he's not beating himself up about his zest for life or his energy levels or anything like that because he's got a clear diagnosis. And it's so quick that he turns around because instead of, not not physically, but psychologically, because once he's got that piece of information, oh, you've actually got a virus, he can interpret how he's feeling in a totally different way. And interpretation is so important. He's no longer blaming himself. He's no longer worrying why. He's no longer worrying if it will last forever. All sorts of things become cleared up with a correct diagnosis. And for Treya, well, she's working with, still, with the thing of doing and being. And she has a realization that these are archetypal issues which other human beings have been working with. She starts to open up to having a sense of okayness about things being as they are. And one of the things she does to help with this healing and therapy is she starts gardening. And this really is a beautiful thing. This is perfect. This is the exact thing that Trey needs. Because gardening, well, it takes a lot of effort. You know, she's digging there, she's taking out stones, she's preparing the soil, she's getting fencing up and all the nutrients and the water and all sorts of things. And it's actually quite hard. It's quite physical. She gets a sore back sometimes. And so that's like the doing. That's the masculine action. Let's change the world. Let's let's try and improve things. But then once the seeds are planted, well, then it becomes more of a nurturing then it becomes more of a a patience and a hoping and an allowing. And slowly, slowly, that work and that caring, doing, transitions into a being. Because then up come the sprouts. And she's grateful just to have something. She's in awe to see that something so beautiful could come from just some seeds. And she planted them seeds herself. She says, oh, there's all sorts of seeds. Some of them are so small. Some of them are wonky. Some of them are this shape, that shape. And she's got cauliflower and some peas and some spinach. 
So it's a good variety. But once they start growing, it's just an it's just enough for them to be. It's just okay. It's fine for them to exist. It's fulfilling enough just to walk over to the garden and see them growing. She also talks about this old thing of there's this Zen saying which is before enlightenment chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment chop wood and carry water. And she has a bit of a back and forth about herself because she's you know, she's well aware of this whole thing of oh I want to become enlightened. And she figures that that's not for her. It's not quite right for her to get into that sort of space or to become a hardcore devotee or to really beat herself up. Oh, I have to become enlightened this lifetime. So the way she puts it is that she wants to learn how to chop wood and carry water in fullness. And there's a bit of back and forth. There's a bit of a roundabout. Like this is an ongoing thing for anyone who's interested in the spiritual path. You know, oh, am I enlightened? Are we going to become enlightened? Or can I? do I have a chance of becoming enlightened? Or what is enlightenment? That's a fun game. That can go on for, that can go on for years if you're interested in, in the spiritual practices that, the sort, that are the sorts of things that Ken and Treya do. But I find that in a in a funny sense, she's almost she's almost sidestepped all of that. Because if you can chop wood and carry water in fullness, well that almost is like being enlightened. Without delving into complex varieties of definitions of what enlightenment is. But that's very interesting to hear how she words that and how she brings that back down to a less craving, less grasping, less purpose-driven life and more to a being and allowing and to a contentment kind of meditative life. And then there's also this thing, well, Trey has this friend and it's just just one of her friends that she's written about in her journal. And this friend sometimes feels very envious of others, but doesn't know quite what to do about it. And the story with this friend is, well, she had this partner and he was tragically murdered by a robber. And so she's a single woman. And Treya sort of thinks, well... You know, this friend of ours is seeing Ken and me together and how, you know, well, we've been through some stuff, but we're also really beautiful together. And her friend's asking her, like, what what do I do? Like, I sort of don't want to be with someone. I don't, I'm not interested in a com- committed relationship. But honestly, it makes me feel really unhappy. And she tries to make it stop, but she can't. And she's telling this to Treya. And Trey is sort of thinking it through and saying, well, this is craving and aversion. Just like the Vipassana teaching says, the Buddhist teaching says. And Trey's suggestion is, well, what she thinks will work is to, to notice it, to watch it and experience it fully. Now, she's aware that she's feeling unhappy, And she's observed it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she's experiencing it fully. And Treya's theory is that if you don't make an effort to change or stop a certain behavior, then it will actually learn, you'll actually learn how to change it by observation. And there's a few different analogies that I thought of to try and explain this. Like, say, Say you've got a door and and there's five yous. We turn you into five people. It's all you. And then these five people, which are all you, try and go through the door all at the same time. 
And they sort of go, oh, sorry, my mistake. Oh, no, out of the way. No, oh, it's not going to work. No, uh, we're not going to fit. Uh, no, I don't fit. And you're sort of talking around yourself like this, talking to yourself like this. Oh, no, it doesn't work. Oh, yes. Oh, pardon me. No, let me try again. And all the t- and this is this is on repeat as well. They're all just f- trying at the same time. Five people st- through this same doorway. Now this is the same thing with feelings because there's something in you that knows. Well, you feel unhappy. Something in you that also doesn't want to feel happy. Also, someone that's trying to change that you feel happy, and then also someone that's unaware of that you are happy and trying to deny it. And it's it's just five people going through this doorway, and it's uh, it's a crunch. So in that situation, what needs to happen is the five people need to just wait and look around and observe that, oh, there are five other people, so let's slow down. And if they really look at where the other people are going, they can fit in smoothly and then they can go through the door one after the other. It's like merging into traffic. If you look at the other cars when you're merging onto the highway, well, then you fit in seamlessly. But if you don't look, well, then you crash and there's a big pile up. So Treya says that this way of observing is a way of finding out how it can unfold in its own way. Because you're trying to find something that you don't know. This friend of hers, this friend of Trey's, doesn't know how to, well, deal with this feeling of unhappiness. So how are you... Here's this question. I mean, this, is, was, this was in this Rebecca Solnit book, A Field Guide to Getting Lost, which is how are you going to find the very thing that you don't know anything about? Well, this is the answer. And the other thing we'll mention here is that There's a difference between the external world and the internal world. Now, in the external world, when you're actually dealing with objects, then you can actually force things. You can push, and you could actually get five people and push them through the door, and you could just push them through, and they'll get through the door. But in the inner world, well, that doesn't work. You can't force it. If you've got a tangle, you can just cut the string and then flesh it all out, frizz it all out to undo the knot. But when the knot is inside, well, then that doesn't work. And Treya says, well, it's beyond our capacity to consciously will something. So it's more of an allowing and an opening. And then... This word comes up because someone says it's a little like grace. And yes, it's actually something in the course of miracles that Trey has been thinking about to do with grace. And it's this quote that is, by grace I live, by grace I am released, by grace I live, by grace I will release. And Treya says, well, she's been sort of reading these lines, but it hasn't really meant much to her. And she hasn't really felt, well, she's not really into the father, but paternalistic father figure of God either, this forgiving sort of, forgiving his sinning children. But now, with the experience of explaining this inner tangle to her friend, it makes more sense. She can see grace as a way of describing this process, this mysterious something in her that's able to heal, that's able to keep them going in the right direction, to repair their faults. And if we look at the word grace, well, there's sort of, there's sort of two meanings. Because we say, well, the grace of God, or we say grace at dinner time, it's like a prayer. And then we have the other side, and that's sort of like the spiritual version, but then we have the other side, which is, oh, that ballerina was very graceful. Or you did that movement very gracefully. Or when she walks, she's very graceful. And you can see the connection there, because if we go back to our analogy of 
five people trying to cram in through the door at the same time. Well, that's not very graceful. But what they do need is to actually become graceful and calm down and do it with grace, to do it gracefully. So that's some depths to this word grace. And we know from the title of this story that this word has a deep meaning. So keep this word grace in your back pocket because it will be appearing again. And then there's also more about Ken and Treya as a couple because they're seeing couples, they're seeing a couples therapist and they realize that it's, in, it's very important not just what they say to each other but how they say it. And they've identified their patterns and it's funny because they go to couples therapy and they can identify their patterns very easily with the therapist there. For some reason, just having that person makes them able to catch on very quickly. And well, what happens when they're in a downward spiral? Well, Ken gets anxious and then he gets snide. And then Treya withdraws because she feels unloved. And that sort of goes back and forth. And they can really batter each other. But slowing down and not reacting so quickly and taking time to say things very gently, in a gentle way, really helps with stopping that sudden downward spiral. And they've just moved into this new house and... Treya asks Ken, well, how do you think the new place is turning out? And he sort of has some something, you know, oh, some sort of anxiety there. And she realizes, oh, okay, so there's something there, but I won't react. And she goes away and she thinks about it. She wonders. Like, really, she really tries to understand what he's trying to, what he's feeling. And she wonders, well, now we've moved to this new place and he's got this new library. So all his books are in there. And he's got his own space. Is there going to be this thing of, oh, are you going to start writing again? And of course, there's a lot of weight on that. The great Ken Wilbur, will he start writing again? When's the next book coming, Ken? Are you writing anything, Ken? What are you working on, Ken? This sort of pressure. And it doesn't matter if people say it or not. I'm sure there would be people that say it. But he would have that as a pressure on himself. And at this stage, he's just saying, no, I don't, I don't feel the urge. I just need to. He just wants to get back into basic ABC spiritual practice. And Trey is thinking this through. And she then goes to Ken and says, well, is this how you feel? And he says, yes. Yes, that's a better way of putting it. So now they've actually reversed the downward spiral and it's actually working in a positive direction which means instead of misunderstanding each other and then allowing those misunderstandings to lead to worse comments worse tone of voice worse feelings they're actually recognizing that they don't understand something about each other and then taking the time to understand and to acknowledge that they don't understand and then use that as a building towards a more positive relationship. And the other side of couples counselling is, well, they actually do individual sessions as well. And Treya mentions that, well, in her individual sessions, she just wanted to talk about the relationship, the relationship issues. She didn't want them to focus so much on her. And that was a big thing. That's a big realization to have. 
And it's one thing to say that, but to actually to, to feel that. Can you feel the moment when someone directs the attention to you? And to have someone sit there and say, no, you're talking about a relationship issue, Treya. What are your issues? And that can be jarring, but also opening. So on the emotional and the mental levels, they're doing therapy. And they're also doing their diets, their mega vitamins and their raw foods. And they're also learning to digest and integrate various unresolved, in, unre, unresolved issues by re, learning to rewrite their bruised scripts. And on the spiritual level, well, they're practicing acceptance and forgiveness and meditation and doing various things to re-establish the witness or their connection to the big self, self with a capital S. So that's a lot, particularly in, let's probably drill into some of these because that's, that's quite a lot. We've sort of covered some of these, but how about, how about rewriting bruised scripts do you know how that works? In essence, what happens is you have this relationship and you have bad feelings between you. And on top of those feelings, you have scripts, you have comments that you say. And sometimes it's the same comment multiple times. Sometimes there's a structure to the comment. So it's a different comment in terms of its content, but the structure of it is the same every time. So this would just be like a snappy comment, a crude comment. It might be about some it might be about the dishes one day, it might be about the cleaning on the f washing the next day, but it's really the same thing. So that's the script. So you're working on the emotional level to change the feelings, and then on the script level, you're thinking, okay, now what's the proper words to say with these feelings? And of course, it works vice versa as well. You can say, oh, I've said that before, but I won't say that now. Let me find something new to say. So the comments that you always used to say over and over again, well, they now become something as a, as a trigger to say, oh, this is something I need to work on. And then you say, well, what's something that's new? How do I put this into new, fresh words? And they can become the script. And then you can have a positive script. You can say, oh, he's always telling me how sweet he is. He's always telling me how sweet I am. Something like that. Or he's always saying, he's always making that same joke in a different, slightly different way. Or she's always supporting me with this comment. So that's script level. That's a different part of the psychology. And then on top of all this, they're also trying to find out some they're trying to find some guru or meditation teacher for them and they're hanging out with some pretty heavy guys and they're pretty open because they're well they're eclectic in terms of spiritual and meditative practices so they're open in terms of well who's going to be the guru or the teacher that they like so they start hanging out with a wide range of of assortment of teachers like I'll, I'll just try and name some of them here that he's listed father bebe griffins koban chino roshi tai siptupa jamgon control trungpa rinposh the free john katagirir pirvalet khan and father thomas keating to name a few. <laughs> I could pronounce Father Thomas Keating pretty easily. <laughs> but there's some stories in there about how Ken meets up with one of his old Zen masters. And actually, this is, the, this is where the story is. I mean, we mentioned it before, but this is where the story is where he was working on the witness and his Zen teacher came up behind him and whispered in his ear the... Witness is the ego's last defense, and that was his breakthrough to a Satori experience. And he says, oh, it was a really little one. <laughs> and they're sort of having, like, I get the impression they're sort of 
they're sort of at dinner, you know, they've got some drinks and they're having an old joke like, ah, oh, remember the time, this and all that. And it's sort of this jolly and, you know, one of these, one of these Zen teachers, K- Katagiri, I think it is. He's sort of got this, this massive smile about him. He's just this really joyful person. So it's not all doom and gloom sort of se- like meditation isn't so serious, but it's just really funny to hear what it's like to be around some of these people. And another thing Treya says is, well, they're looking for someone to study meditation with. And Treya says that she always looks at a teacher's senior students to see what the teacher is really like. So if you want to pick a teacher, you want to pick a guru, go and see what someone is like after they've studied with that person for two or three years. So who's someone who's studied with this guru for two or three years and what are they like? What's someone who knows all the ins and outs of their methods and they're really into it? What do they get out of it? And then say, do you want some of that? Is there something there that you feel like you would be enriched by if you got it? And of course, you can't really know exactly what it is. But that's just a very good metric, a very intelligent metric of finding a teacher. And at the end of this chapter, well, Ken just takes a moment to reflect. And he realizes that Treya is an incredibly beautiful woman. And he loves her so much. Just her resilience, her equanimity, her strength, her ability to surrender, and her uncompromising honesty. And he says he has never seen her lie. And that means a lot. And it's easy to forget that because we sort of go through this story looking at these people and they're bringing up their issues. And it's easy to sort of think, wow, these people have so many issues. They're not very good. But that's not the case at all. It really is not the case. Because the ability, the strength to speak honestly about your issues and to really say what what you're feeling and what you're thinking, it takes an extraordinary amount of courage. And when you meet someone like that, when you actually interact with someone like that, the last thing you're thinking is, wow, this person has problems. No, on the contrary, you're thinking, wow, this person has a a great awareness. This person has a great ability to navigate the complexities of life, the complexities of what it means to be alive. And in the case of Treya, well, perhaps there's no one. There's no one who's gone as deep as she has. There's no one as courageous as she is, as she is. And for Ken to sit back and actually realize how beautiful she is, how true she is, and how she embraces the all so much, it really is just... It's just beauty. It's just, words cannot describe it. And when he says he has never seen her lie, she has never lied. She's had an unwavering honesty. And that really is something that's a very rare human being. And that's where we're going to end this chapter. There are a few loose ends from this chapter, that's for sure. 
There are other side plots. Well, there are other points in the main plot which are sort of on the peripheries at this point, but they're starting to come up. So I won't give it away. We can put those into the next chapter. And the next chapter is, well, the next chapter is going to be a big one. So bring your thinking cap for the next chapter, because that will be chapter 11. And it's titled Psychotherapy and Spirituality. So thanks very much. And... We'll be back very soon. And that's all I have to say for now.